country apart from the United States. It will be tragic to jeopardize this strength. Once the tap has been turned off, it can't readily be turned on again. As well as supporting individual excellence, the Royal Society advances research by its publications, printed and electronic, and by its high quality discussion meetings on topical scientific themes. But its reach now extends beyond the professional community into science education and into public engagement. More and more issues of public policy have a scientific dimension. And that's why the society has recently expanded its policy center so as to enhance its ability to offer authoritative advice. We cherish our independence. We offer our advice whether it's asked for or not. Public debate and political decisions should be based on the best assessment of the science. And it's surely our society's responsibility to provide such input to governments and via the media to the wider public. We must confront widely held anxieties that the uses of genetics, brain science and artificial intelligence may run away too fast. And we must address questions like who should access the readout of our personal genetic code? How will our lengthening lifespans affect society? Should we build nuclear power stations or wind farms if we want to keep the lights on? Should we use more insecticides or plant GM crops? How much should computers take over our lives? All those questions. Science has never respected national boundaries. Right back in the 1660s, the Royal Society proclaimed its intention to, I quote, promote commerce in all parts of the world with the most curious and philosophical persons to be found. Indeed, scientists still collaborate in times of tension and even conflict. Benjamin Franklin urged the American rebels to give free passage to Captain Cook's ship. Humphrey Davy traveled freely in France during the Napoleonic Wars. Western scientists retained contact with their Soviet counterparts throughout the Cold War. Collaborations in science straddle today's deepest political divides. And more and more of the challenges confronting us need to be tackled at the broadest international level. To stem the risk of environmental degradation, to adopt clean energy and sustainable agriculture, to prevent pandemics, it's essential to develop appropriate technology and to apply it optimally in all parts of the world. The Royal Society should be at the forefront of these campaigns. Our fellowship spans the Commonwealth. Our distinguished foreign members hail from all over the world. We join forces with all the world's academies through the Inter-Academy Panel and other collaborations to promote these goals. Our new Cavley International Centre at Chichley Hall in Buckinghamshire will allow a timely step change in our activities in these increasingly important areas. Incidentally, we especially value our cordial and effective links with the very strong United States National Academy of Sciences. Though I like to point out to my friends there that had events panned out differently in 1776, all North America might still be in the Commonwealth and its members would instead all be fellows of the Royal Society. Well, in the 50 years since the last convocation, not only has science advanced amazingly, but all parts of our ever more crowded world have become more interlinked and interdependent. The Earth has existed for 45 million centuries, but we've entered the first century where one species, ours, is numerous and empowered enough to determine the future of the entire biosphere. All too often, even these grave global challenges are trumped on the political agenda by the urgent or the parochial. People tend to downplay what's happening even now in impoverished faraway countries. And they give too little thought to what kind of world we leave for future generations. It's fitting that the speaker who will follow me, my good friend Professor Sianar Rao, is not only himself 
a great scientist, but also an inspirational figure who has dedicated his life to India and the developing world. Finally, let me quote Bill Bryson, another good friend of this society. I quote, if we have an earth worth living on 100 years from now, the Royal Society will be one of the organizations that our grandchildren will wish to thank. Well, the society does matter, not just to those gathered here today, but to the wider world and its future. Let us build on our achievements and be worthy of our past. Thank you very much. Your Majesty, Your Royal Highnesses, Fellows, Lords, Ladies and Gentlemen, I consider it, consider it a great honor to have this opportunity to say a few words on this historic occasion in response to the wise and optimistic words of our dear President, who follows a line of illustrious scientists who have guided this society. It is also a most wonderful experience for me and for all of us here that our patron and royal fellows are with us. Their presence this afternoon clearly demonstrates their support and affection for the society. We are delighted that Prince William has become a royal fellow and we look forward to his association with the society. The Royal Society has played a major role in the progress and development of science and in the lives of many scientists. I am one of those who is proud to be a fellow of this great academy. I was born in the princely state of Mysore when the British ruled India. I now belong to a large country in the Commonwealth. The first major international recognition that I received was my election to the fellowship of the Royal Society nearly three decades ago. This made a big difference in my academic life. Of the several science academies that I belong to, I have the greatest loyalty to the Royal Society. The Royal Society has played a key role in the scientific world in many important ways. It has been the voice of science and a voice of sanity and has promoted science internationally. The Indian Institute of Science Bangalore, of which I have been associated for over half a century, was started 100 years ago based on the recommendation of a committee of the Royal Society. It was the first academic institution devoted to scientific research established in British India. Today, the Indian Institute of Science is probably the best postgraduate research institute in India with 1,400 PhD students working on various aspects of science and engineering. Besides electing fellows, conferring research professorships, on outstanding scientists and selectively providing grants for academic projects, the Royal Society has been responsible for communicating with the scientific community and with the society at large. It can proudly claim Faraday and Attenborough as its own. It has given birth to or provided the base to many leaders in science. It is not surprising that most leaders of science have had close connection with the Royal Society. In the last few decades, there have been major changes in the world of science. Not only has science itself changed, but also the way we do science. There is greater science-based human migration. There is increasing impact of science on technology and vice versa. Investment in science has undergone an upward increase in many countries. Collaborative and group efforts are getting to be common and even necessary. In the years to come, Scientific collaboration will become essential to tackle glo global problems associated with climate, energy, food security, water, and such areas. I have no doubt that the Royal Society will continue to take serious interest in global problems through interaction with other countries, especially those which may not be equipped to participate fully. It will be beneficial if the Royal Society establishes even greater contact with the scientists and individuals of eminence in various countries. There is increasing recognition that expertise in science alone 
is not sufficient for global leadership. The term technology gets automatically attached to science, and people talk of science and technology as if they're inseparable. Innovation has become the key word in today's jargon. Competition for global leadership in science, technology, and innovation has increased in the last 20 years or so, and this has, this has had some effect on scientific pursuit in the sense that we scientists can no longer be just free thinkers doing science for pleasure. In this situation, the Royal Society has been a champion of science and has helped to protect, and helped to protect science with simultaneously moving, uh, at the same time, moving the times. We all need the Royal Society to ensure that unfettered research does not become the less important component of national and international scientific efforts. We cannot possibly have a situation where science is not at the core of our plans for development and progress. Newer countries are emerging as leaders in science and technology in the last few years. Today, Europe, America, and Asia contribute nearly equally to scientific research. In such a competitive world, the Royal Society has to not only assist Britain in its endeavors, but also become the guiding light to the scientific community as a whole. I see no reason for alarm because of the competition as long as one is dealing, with, dealing only with scientific pursuits. What I find alarming is elsewhere. There is a dark cloud looming large over all the civilized people of the world. A large percentage of humankind has not had the benefits that accrue from scientific exploration. There is widespread ignorance and obscurantism in large parts of the world, and this ignorance has resulted in irrational behavior on a large scale. There is urgent need to inculcate scientific temper amongst common citizens in many parts of the world. This may be more important, in fact, more essential than any other international program that we may be pursuing. It is my feeling that knowledge in general and science in particular could usher an, area, uh, usher, usher an era of equality among the peoples of the world. While, they may, while there may never be economic equality, equality in terms of knowledge, scientific knowledge could instill the necessary self-respect and optimism amongst people to such a measure that we may indeed hope for a peaceful and purposeful world in the future. The Royal Society can play a major role in this social transformation. I have no doubt that the Society will deliberate on issues of this kind in order to use science as an agent of social transformation. We must also recognize that a large number of the least developed countries, the LDCs, want to become adept in science and find a place in the sun. Most of the LDCs do not have the necessary institutional structure in science and higher education. While the situation may change for the better in the years to come, it is utterly hopeless today. I have seen universities in the least developed countries without elementary laboratory facilities. The Royal Society can help in providing the necessary ingredients that make developing countries, especially the LDCs, scientifically capable. It was said many years ago that the British governed India so efficiently, not because of the military power, but because of the graduates trained by them in Britain and in India. Through promotion of science in the developing world, the Royal Society and Britain will have connection with the future leaders in science belonging to a large section of humanity. Science education for the future generations should indeed be a matter of serious concern to all of us. Let me say a few words about Britain and the Royal Society, although I am neither empowered nor have the qualifications to make these comments. I cannot help but take pride in many of the fine accomplishments of Britain in, in science over the last several years. It, has, it, has, it was often said that England had the largest idea density in the world. There is no doubt that this small country produced more ideas in science than any other equivalent area in the world. I would like the Royal Society to continue to promote and protect science in Britain in such a way that Britain will be the fountainhead of knowledge in the years to come. In closing, let me express how wonderful it has been to witness the 350th anniversary of the Royal Society. 
I must thank President Rees and all those who have organized this great event and Her Majesty and the Royal Highnesses for their kind presence. I will certainly not be there for the 400th or the 500th anniversary, but I can foresee how the Royal Society may look like at that time. There is little doubt that the traditions of the Royal Society will guide it to continue to have a leadership role in the world of science. We have had wonderful presidents and officers through the decades. I feel certain that there will be successive scientists of eminence with human concerns at heart to lead us. It is indeed possible that the Royal Society will get to be known as a great science academy that has helped the world to prosper peacefully. I see a great future for this great academy. Thank you all. First, my sincerest thanks on behalf of everyone to Professor Rao for his inspiring address. It's customary in closing a meeting to say that we look forward to getting together again at the next one. But unless the science of life extension makes amazing breakthroughs and soon, that's not realistic for Royal Society convocations. But the other side of that coin is that today will, for most of us, leave a memory that's unique, a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to gather to celebrate the Royal Society's legacy and to look towards its future. Our 17th century founders pioneered a new mode of thought, an enlightenment where evidence would trump traditional authority. It's a mindset that's changed the world as Professor Rao so eloquently explained, it's a global liberating force. Barriers of time aren't so permeable as national boundaries. But looking back over the centuries, we must all feel some affinity with the enthusiasms and attitudes of our founder fellows. We can't be polymaths as they were, as knowledge expands, we need to specialize. We're mindful of how much we owe to our predecessors, but also that science is an open frontier. Our successors in 2060 may be no wiser than us, but they certainly know a lot more. They'll be tackling questions that we can't even pose today. When these formal proceedings are over, I hope you will enjoy our summer science exhibition downstairs and the reception that will take place throughout the building. You will see a fascinating range of projects presented by the young scientists who've done them. And you'll perhaps be tempted to come back over the next week to see some of the events and entertainment that we have in store as we embark with the South Bank Centre on our Festival of Science and Art. So with those words, I would now ask everyone, please, to stand and join in the singing of the National Anthem.